Fidel Castro, popularly named Savior of the Fatherland and Maximum Leader, reached Havana on January 8, 1959, just a day after the U.S. had extended diplomatic recognition to his revolutionary government. If you'll remember, President Batista left Cuba very early in the morning on New Year's Day. Opposition to Batista had first emerged in 1955, and by 1958, the majority of the population despised his government. By December of 1958, even the Eisenhower administration wanted Batista out of office. Moreover, it had long been obvious that U.S. arms were being used to fight what had become a civil war, and quite a debate was going on in the U.S. about this. At the time of the revolution, Havana was home to both the privileged and the marginalized, reflecting both Las Vegas-style glamour and the struggle of hard-working residents. As in most cities, there were both social and geographic divisions. The older and more densely populated sectors of Havana were separated from the more affluent and suburban areas of the city by the Almendares River. A great deal of the American investment was in the Badado section of Havana, where the Hotel Nacional was located. Much of the investment was linked to a proliferation of underworld operations. And to this day, my Cuban friends will point out mob-associated structures and recount anecdotes about the mafia notables who hung out in the area. Hotels constructed in the area between 1953 and 1958 include the Havana Hilton, Havana Riviera, Capri, Bedado, Flamingo, and others. In sum, in the late 1950s, Havana was a center of commercialized vice, much of it underwritten by U.S. organized crime. The city was famous for its glitzy atmosphere, and American businessmen were attracted by illicit drugs, prostitution, and the gambling casinos, which were the city's major industry. This would soon change. Castro set up his headquarters on the 22nd floor of the 25-story Havana Hilton, where many American businessmen and mafia associates were staying. The hotel was renamed the Havana Libre, and it's seen as an emblem of the revolutionary struggle to this day. Bad blood between Castro and the American government soon ensued. It's hard to know for sure what happened because communication signals were mixed on both sides. At first, though, everything was fine. American Ambassador Earl Smith described the rebels as friendly and courteous surprisingly capable in preserving order among the population and exhibiting not the slightest anti-American sentiment. An American banker confessed, the way their troops have behaved so far throws dust on the fear that they're a bunch of communists. Another Yankee businessman exclaimed, they're just nice kids. Before long, though, things were changing, and there was a lot of tit for tat. When Cuba nationalized U.S. petroleum properties, Eisenhower eliminated Cuba from the U.S. sugar quota. Consequently, Castro turned to the former Soviet Union for assistance. It's safe to say that the Cuban Revolution would certainly have failed without massive Soviet military, political, and economic support. As the 1960s progressed, Castro's focus was on dealing with the U.S. embargo. He was also preoccupied with developing a model of socialist self-government that was uniquely Cuban. During this period, more specifically, he wanted to ruralize the city and to urbanize the countryside. Resources poured into rural areas for electrification and the construction of new towns. The literacy campaign was in full swing, and there was improvement in health care outside of the cities. Roads and buildings in Havana, especially, suffered from a lack of upkeep and maintenance. However, as time went by, and especially after the island's failure to achieve its goal of a 10 million ton sugar harvest in 1970, 
Castro was forced to rely more and more on the Soviets. In 1972, Cuba joined ConCon, the economic arm of the Soviet bloc. And in 1975, Cuba began implementing Soviet economic and planning principles. These actions affected every aspect of daily life and facilitated Havana's social, cultural, and political integration with the Soviet bloc. Now, let's fast forward to 1986. This is an important year in Cuban history because it marks the beginning of a new period called the period of rectification. By this time, Cubans were becoming very disillusioned. They were rejecting Soviet models of economic and social planning and were pressuring their government to return to the core revolutionary project. They took a critical look at their past relationship with the Soviet Union and became determined to forge a new future, building on the accomplishments of the revolution while providing for the civil defense. Cuban socioeconomic indicators give us some hard data on Cuban accomplishments. Also, don't forget the significant gains in the status of women and blacks. Unfortunately, though, for Cuba, changes in the Soviet Union, glasnost or openness, and perestroika, restructuring, were beginning at about the same time, putting an end to any reforms that Cuba might have hoped for. In 1990, with the end of the Cold War, the country entered a challenging era known as the Special Period of War in Time of Peace. The government could no longer focus on social development. The total withdrawal of support by the Soviet bloc entailed a struggle for Cuba's very survival. Just a few statistics here. Cuba had an oil-driven economy and 98% of all of the island's petroleum came from the Soviet bloc. The Cubans had been re-exporting some of this oil to generate hard currency, but suddenly this resource was no longer available. Aside from oil, 66% of the country's food, 86% of all raw material, and 80% of machinery and spare parts came from Soviet-dominated trading partners. When this support was withdrawn, factory closures became common, food scarcity was widespread, and the already inadequate technology base began eroding. Work centers cut back their hours, street lighting was reduced, most regular taxis were taken off the road, TV was reduced to five hours on weekdays, Air conditioning was prohibited in most government offices, and perhaps most importantly, night baseball games were suspended. Not just imports, but exports also were affected. 66% of Cuba's sugar, 73% of the island's nickel, and 98% of the country's citrus fruits were being exported to the Soviet bloc. As one Cuban explained to me, we traded sugar for everything else. Cuba's abandonment by the USSR was further complicated by a tightening of U.S. sanctions through the Helms-Burton Act, which was passed on March 12, 1996, and the Torricelli Act, passed in 1992. If you'll remember, Helms-Burton imposes international sanctions on companies who do business in Cuba and then also want to do business in the U.S. And the Torricelli Act strengthens sanctions to include food and medicine. 